Welcome to our session called GSA and the Evolution of Government Contracts. I'm Holly Capos. I'm Corporate Counsel at MX Group, and I'm moderating the session. Next to me is Larry Allen. Larry is Managing Director at BDO and has 30 years of federal government acquisition experience. Before starting his own successful consulting practice, he ran a major association of government contractors for 20 years. Larry is an author and a frequent contributor to industry publications. He also serves as an adjunct professor at George Washington University, where he created and teaches a course on interagency contracting. Next to Larry is Rob Burton. Rob is the former deputy administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement and is currently a nationally recognized federal procurement attorney. A 30-year veteran of procurement law and policy development, Rob served in the, the Executive Office of the President as Deputy Administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, OFPP, the nation's top career federal procurement official. Last but not least, we have Matt Cole. Matt is a partner at Womble Bond Dickinson and is a veteran government contracts lawyer with more than 20 years of experience representing commercial and defense contractors across a broad range of industries. Matt represents government contractors in bid protests and helps them resolve post-award contract disputes with federal agencies. Clients also turn to him for counseling and litigation support in a broad range of state and local government contracts matters. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I think collectively that's over 80 years of government contract <coughs> experience. So <laughs> we're very lucky to have you all. Um, just real quick. This is a short session, so we're just going to save time at the end for questions rather than taking them throughout the session. So if you think of anything along the way, jot it down, try to remember it, and we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, so let's get started. Cybersecurity, um, or rather supply chain security, has been a hot topic this year. Matt, last year we talked about Kaspersky. Um, this year, seems like Huawei is the big topic. Yeah, so. Huawei, Huawei is a big deal. And if you, you go back about 10 years or so, the federal government uh, through Congress and the agencies have been progressively sort of ratcheting up the supply chain uh, monitoring, supply chain security requirements that they push down to federal contractors. And it, you know, it began with the DOD counterfeit part uh, law and then implementing rules probably seven or so years ago, and, and you know, there, there, were, there were GAO reports that were finding you know, counterfeit parts and major weapon systems that were small components of the systems but caused the entire systems to fail. Um, and so you know, that was sort of a, a, you know, a counterfeit part monitoring uh, requirement. Um, then you had Kaspersky last year, which was you know, a particular vendor who was viewed as you know, too close to an unfriendly government, and, and they made that uh, a vendor-specific um, uh, prohibition where you, you had to keep Spursky out of the federal uh, supply chain. This year, now we have Huawei, uh, and it's Huawei and four other Chinese companies. And their uh, products are banned both for, uh, from a supply perspective, but also uh, can't be used um, to deliver uh, services to the government. So you can't have uh, Huawei, ZTE, or the other three uh, companies' equipment in your data center to deliver services to the government. I think that's where it's, uh, at least what we're hearing from clients is, you know, where it's more of a problem and because it's more applicable than actually supplying these these uh, products to the government. And it was implemented through an interim rule that, you know, came out pretty quickly. And there's a lot of ambiguity in the rule. And so they'll say things like, um, you know, you can't supply equipment from any of these or use it to provide services for any of these five companies or their subsidiaries or affiliates, but they don't tell you what subsidiary or affiliate means, and they also don't tell you, uh, you know, which subsidiaries and affiliates uh, there are. And we know just for Huawei, there are 84 affiliates and subsidiaries, many of whom don't have Huawei in their name. And so they've, you know, the government's really pushed this on the industry in a way that, that, you know, a lot of people in the industry are not you know, terrifically happy about. Um, there are some comments on the interim rule that are, you know, hopefully clarify some of this. But um, one of the other things that's very interesting about this Huawei ban is that currently it applies 
to government contractors and you know, the, the equipment they supply and the services that they provide to the government. But no later than August of next year, um, you know, based on the, the, the statute that the regulations will implement, it applies to uh, all activity by government contractors. So um, you know, no later than August of next year, you're not going to be able to use Huawei uh, equipment in commercial data centers to deliver cloud computing services um, to non-government customers. And at least in my experience, oh, wow. you know, the use of a FAR clause to require government contractors to uh, change their non-government contracting activities is really unusual and uh, you know, obviously reflects some serious concern that the government has about Huawei and, and, and um, you know, its connections to the Chinese government and you know, its um, you know, participation in, in infiltrating uh, U.S. government IT systems. So it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily broad rule. And you know, one of the other things that people need to keep in mind when they think about how do I comply with this is um, you know, it's pretty easy from a supply perspective because that's prospective. You can't deliver it to the government you know, after the interim rule in August. But it's, it, you're not grandfathered in for equipment that you already have and are already using. And so, you know, when you figure out what you need to do as a contractor, you know, not only do you need to make sure that they're not in your, you know, prospective supply chain going forward, you need to scrub, you know, the, the equipment that you currently have um, and that you're currently using to deliver services both to the U.S. government, but, you know, no later than August, it's, it's, it's going to be broader than that. So it's, it's a really unusual, you know, very broad rule that's, you know, caused quite a bit of consternation in industry. And so, you know. Larry, it sounded like you had a comment. Well, he's absolutely right. And uh, the issue is further is that we do have a defined list of companies now, but one of the things that the legislation also does is it sets up a review board a review board that could potentially add to the number of companies that would be on the banned list. So <clears throat> this is somewhat of a moving target. We understand what we have today, but we don't understand what we might have a year from now. And it's not just prime contractors as well. This is, goes down uh, to second and third tier subs at least. And prize of prime, you're going to have to not just scrub your systems, you're going to have to go down and make sure that your subs are also in compliance with this. And some have speculated that it's more than just sending out the annual form certifying, no, I don't have these uh, products anywhere in my business. It's actually something proactive that will be required of prime contractors to say, we went out and did a spot check of X supplier in January, and we can certify that we didn't see any of these uh, prohibited systems in place. So it's a fairly onerous, very far-reaching system. Uh, I think it's going to have a very disproportionate impact on small businesses. Uh, this, more than any other rule that I've seen lately, has the potential to actually drive some companies to the sidelines. Mm -hmm. So it is. It's a very big deal. So is there anything that those small businesses and other companies can do to protect themselves from being sidelined? Well, I think there are a couple of things to do. The first is scrub your systems, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, is a lot easier said than done. I mean, we're talking about, in some cases, things that uh, were very expensive pieces of capital equipment. It's not like, as a small business, you can just, oh, go down to the corner store and swap it out for something that's uh, compliant. Uh, but, you know, that is uh, right now what, uh, what Congress expects. We're going to have to see what the rule says when it comes out. It's going to be an interim rule. Uh, right now, so the speculation is that Congress did not give the rule writers a lot of freedom to carve out exceptions for small businesses or even for commercial items. So I wouldn't expect that to come from the rulemaking process. Uh, at a recent GSA public meeting on this topic, it was suggested that uh, businesses generally go to Congress and ask them to amend the law. Uh, I see that as a, a potential way forward, although one that is uh, not does not give you a long runway, mm -hmm. and also uh, you're essentially going to be asking Congress what they're going to hear is, we want you to make our systems less safe, even though the legitimate business concern is that uh, the 
price and expectation on industry to do it all is going to be higher than some can bear, and that there's going to be a net, there could be anyway, a net loss in innovation that is another perceived good that Congress wants to come from the acquisition system. Gotcha. And I think one of the things that, that we've been seeing is that, you know, typically if you're a, a prime contractor, you, you know, quite often will flow down requirements of, you know, FAR clauses and uh, DOD FAR supplement or DFARS clauses. You'll just put sort of a list at the end of, of your contract and just assume and kind of cross your fingers and hope that the, the subcontractor has process that and we'll comply with that. But what we've been seeing at, at the prime contract level is that the, the gravity of this particular requirement um, is such that it's it's maybe not appropriate to, to flow down to subcontractors in that way and that it's something that you want to put as an express, you know, full text term in a contract, maybe with some indemnity attached to it for a breach. And the, the problem you have with that, and this is another issue for small businesses, is quite often, you know, it's a small business that's reselling cloud computing services provided by a very large business. Mm -hmm. And when the when the small prime contractor with not a lot of leverage goes to the very large subcontractor and wants this additional protection, contractually quite often the answer is, well, that that's nice, but no. Um, and so that's a, an additional issue for, for small business concerns in particular in this uh, Huawei, ZTE, et cetera. Have you seen enforcement action related to the Kaspersky ban? And if so, would Huawei be similar? I have not seen any enforcement on Kaspersky. And in my sort of, what I've heard from clients about Kaspersky is that it was not, it was all prospective. I mean, it was, there was a problem for the government because they had Kaspersky on a lot of devices and they had to figure out which ones it was on and get them off. But that was a government issue, not a contractor issue. And, you know, Kaspersky, at least as it's been explained to me, was sort of a mid-tier um, antivirus software that was pretty easily, it wasn't that special. And so it was pretty easy to replace in terms of prospective sales. And I, I, I haven't, I don't know if you guys have seen anything different. I've not seen any enforcement activity on Kaspersky. Okay. Well, that kind of leads to my next question is, is there an opportunity for suppliers here who are providing telecommunications equipment that obviously doesn't contain the band um, equipment. Can, is it's, there an opportunity to sell to the government those items they need to replace? Well, I think there's definitely that opportunity to, to sell to the government uh, those items. There are a couple of factors uh, right now. One, the obvious one is that we're operating as a government under a continuing resolution, which means that if you're going to use appropriated funds to do something new, uh, you can't buy that equipment right now unless it's, you know, you can if it's a follow-on to something you're already doing. Uh, so that's a, a money prohibition. Uh, one of the things that I've seen, and I'd be interested in hearing my panelists' views on this as well, is that despite what government rules are, there's also daily behavior. Mm -hmm. And the daily behavior of some government buyers and some government agencies doesn't always match what the rules are. Uh, we saw a DOD IG report that came out this summer that said essentially just that. Uh, so we'll see people who buy things on eBay uh, that, you know, who knows what the provenance of the supply chain of was for that, but, you know, that's the only place where they can find a piece of equipment. Or there's always somebody who's out looking for a bargain, who's looking to get it for a better price, and they can say, oh, I got this piece of equipment for 75% off what that, a uh, government contractor wanted to sell it to me for, not realizing that it's probably not authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, it may have a few extra little things in it that you didn't really realize were crawling out the sides, and that uh, it's going to cost your agency a lot more than you saved on the acquisition. Yeah, well, do you, Rob and Matt, any thoughts on that? Well, they certainly, you know, the people that are in their space lost a competitor. That's certainly true and that's helpful yeah. to them. Um, I think all this is very political, Holly. I mean, I think that uh, don't be surprised if you see more laws coming down that add a few other company names. Um, I don't think this is probably a good approach to procurement to do everything very, in a very piecemeal fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're seeing here. And I think the compliance challenges are huge because a lot of these component parts, nobody knows exactly what the origins are. You know, in many instances, especially 
small businesses have a difficulty in tracing the actual supply chain. But this is an area that the government is very keen on, and I don't think, uh, I think we're going to have to deal with it. I don't think this is something that's just going to pass away in a year or two. This, uh, this paranoia now that really has uh, developed with respect to supply chain risk mm -hmm. and making sure that our systems are safe, it's just, it's just huge. Yeah. It's probably the leading issue right now in federal procurement. And you're going to see it enter into places that you may not have thought about, and it's going to affect everything. Um, including these e-marketplaces, uh, which we're going to be talking about. We'll get about. to that, yes. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the best industry is going to do on this Huawei, ZTE, et cetera, ban is to get some clarity on the regulatory definitions when the final rule that followed the interim rule comes out. Because And I'm not going to drag us down into the weeds of that, but there are four or five terms in that that are critical to understanding whether or not it applies in a particular context mm -hmm. that have that are steeped in much ambiguity. and. There, I think there are 17 very detailed sets of comments, including one that we filed, um, on the interim rule. So, you know, I understand why this is important, and government's not going to—they're not going to pull back from this. Mm -hmm. But I think for industry, it would be a, a nice result would be some additional clarity on on how to conduct yourself um, relative to the requirements. Yeah, absolutely. So, with that, let's cover CMMC. That's to Rob's point. It's more and more supply chain security regulation coming down. So, Larry, can you give us an overview? So, where we are on uh, this is the cyber ma uh, maturity model certification that is first coming to the DOD world. Uh, just uh, in the past week, we saw DOD uh, release a preliminary version. I think this is point six uh, that uh, will give provide some guidance to industry on where they are right now with the cyber maturity model that they're thinking of. They will issue a rule uh, sometime this coming summer uh, that will go into effect for all DOD purchasing. Essentially what this means is that anybody who is selling to the Department of Defense is going to have to show that they have a cybersecurity uh, protection program set up in their uh, companies, that it's something that is mature and consistent and that it also has outside third-party verification that it meets a, a set of standards. And the standards will rank companies one through five, one being the uh, less strenuous and five being the top-line security measure. Uh, and then the government will then, DOD will then put out RFQs and RFPs slotted that will allow companies with certain certifications to bid. So the thinking right now is that the baseline for a prime contractor would be to require level three certification for a CMMC standard. Uh, so if you, if you come out with a level three procurement, congratulations, you can bid on it. But if, you come, if your customer comes out with a level four and you only have a level three, well, you're going to be shut out of that acquisition uh, unless you can prove to them that you can get to four pretty quick. My, my concern with this whole thing, Holly, is when you have levels like this, a one to a five, uh, do you really want to put something out on the street that says we just need a level one? And in many cases, a level one would be fine. It would be fine, especially for some small business um, set-aside procurements. Uh, probably that would be fine. But my concern is that government folks are going to say, well, I don't I want more than a one. You know, I, I want at least a three. Or maybe I should get, a, I mean, why do I want to? You can see everything's going to be going to four and five, right? I mean, there's going to be a push, and it's just not necessary, it's not needed, and it's going to be very expensive for contractors. I guess the good news is that these will be allowable costs that you can claim. But still, it's an enormous burden and resource uh, problem for smaller companies in particular. And a lot of folks, I know the Department of Defense thinks that everybody just does business with the Department of Defense, but in fact, a lot of contractors deal with civilian agencies. They have FedRAMP certifications. They may one day decide, well, maybe I'd like to work on a DOD contract. Query, will my FedRAMP certification that I have over here in the civilian world, will that be recognized and will that be transferable over to DOD? Uh, and is that a level one? Is that a level three? What is that uh, as far as transferability? I know DOD is looking at reciprocity. I think it's absolutely critical that there be reciprocity. 
But I think this is going to be a huge challenge uh, with respect to, to what degree it will be FedRAMP will still have weight within the Department of Defense. It's going to be very complex. That's a great point. And speaking of the levels of certification, will that level need to flow all the way down the supply chain? Well, it certainly is going to flow down the supply chain. Uh, if you are a prime and you have a level three, your subs may or may not uh, need to have a level three depending on the amount of work they're going to do. Uh, but here's the catch. The more work your sub wants to do or is eligible to do, the more likely they are to be able to have to match the level of certification you have as the prime. Otherwise, they're likely to be restricted on how much they can participate uh, in that opportunity. And while we're today talking about a DOD marketplace, make no mistake, there's already discussion of having a CMMC standard for civilian agencies that will come in maybe 21. So eventually this is going to get to the entire government. And Rob's point is a good one. How do you match up the tier one through five for a cyber maturity model with not just FedRAMP, but with FISMA security standards mm -hmm. as well? Uh, there's going to have to be a crosswalk put together. And unfortunately or fortunately, they use the same terminology, but one person's level three is not necessarily somebody else's. You know, one question I had, and there, there may not be an answer to this at this point, but, um, you know, obviously the, the RFP will specify, okay, the prime contractor has to be level three, level four, whatever it says. Um, then the prime will have subcontractors. Typically, a prime contractor can often make decisions about, okay, I think this is a commercial item subcontract, so I'm only going to flow down those clauses. And as long as it's reasonable, that's within the province of the prime uh, to make that decision about the subcontract and what should be in it in terms of federal procurement requirements. Is there a sense for how that's going to work uh, in this context? So is, it, is that going to be the prime decision? Or is the RFP going to tell the prime what it has to do relative to the subs? Or don't we know? I don't know that we know yet. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, keeps coming out in development. That's why uh, DOD issued a .6 uh, this past week, I believe. And then in, uh, next month, they're supposed to come out with a .7. They'll probably fill in some of the missing gaps along the lines of what you just uh, suggested. Uh, I can see that particularly for the first procurements out of the barrel, where the RFPs will definitely require a certain level of subcontractor certification. Uh, so get certified now. Uh, when we start to get a little bit more common sense and a little bit more comfort, then that might ease off. Yeah, Matt, Matt my prediction on this is that the government will definitely require that the whatever the prime is held to, it's going to flow down to the sub, whether it's necessary or not. This goes again to this concern about the supply chain. And I think the subcontractors is exactly who they want to get to. You know, the subcontractors, they're very concerned about. And they're very concerned about things sneaking in the supply chain through this, up the subcontractor level. So I think you're definitely going to see no discretion here with respect to the prime. I don't think we'll have any discretion. I think there'll be a mandatory flow down to whatever level you are, your subs are better be at that same level. So similar to DOD counterfeit electronic parts where it just goes down to two, three, four tiers down. Exactly. Whether or not it's COTS. Exactly. I think that that's my prediction. And at this point, they've said there's no exemption for COTS. Is that correct? Right. That's right. For uh, the CMMC, uh, how they address COTS and where how it's going to come out uh, I think remains ultimately to be seen, but I would not expect any widespread exemptions. Look, the government buys a lot of COTS IT solutions that forms the backbone of many critical systems. We're not going to see an exemption for critical systems. <laughs> Understood. So is there anything contractors can do to prepare ahead of next summer when we're expecting this to be in RFQs? My, my, uh, I think there are two pieces of homework contractors have right now. One is it's absolutely critical to stay up to date on what's happening uh, with the developments that are coming out. Uh, to its credit, the DOD organizations that are involved with this are actively out talking to industry. They're not hiding. Uh, they come out to industry associations not infrequently. 
uh, the fact that they are putting out a 0.5, a 0.6, and a 0.7 indicates that they want you to play along, that they want the feedback and they want you to understand. The second thing I would do is to start to identify an organization that can get you that third-party certification. And have those organizations been identified at this point? I don't know that we have a lot that are identified, but there's certainly a lot that are gearing up to provide this. Mm -hmm. And I would think that at the start of the calendar year, uh, we will start to see some that uh, are properly identified. Because look, this is going to be something that has to happen by the middle of next summer, mm -hmm. which happens to be federal busy season, That's if right. we actually have a busy season this year. <laughs> That's another topic. Uh, so it's not like we have a real long time mm -hmm. to get this done. So it's always good to start looking now. Excellent. Are there any opportunities here for suppliers? Well, I th you know, if you're a supplier, you know, you want to make sure that you're uh, aware of, of what's going on here and that you're working with your channel partners to make sure that your products, your solutions meet the requirements mm -hmm. that they're going to have to, to meet. If you're a, a supplier that sells primarily uh, through a, a channel, and you're not a prime contractor, this is not the time to be sitting back and uh, assuming that everything's going to be fine for your government business. You have to be proactive. Okay. And I guess you could edge out your competition if you're certified to a level three and I think there'll be an, an advantage uh, to it, certainly. Uh, overall, there's a net advantage. However, when you look at FedRAMP, even though FedRAMP's a requirement and it's been a requirement for cloud, still not every federal agency embraces FedRAMP for every cloud acquisition. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say it's an absolute advantage, mm -hmm. but it certainly would be a comparative one uh, that would come into effect certainly for any major acquisition. Got it, thank you. Let's switch gears. Um, Rob, I've been hearing about the e-commerce portal for, for a while now, and um, now the solicitation is finally out. So what is it and where are we? So this is a real challenge for GSA. I mean, Congress in its wisdom decided that G they wanted GSA to take the lead in putting out uh, RFP for an online, mar well, online marketplaces. There'll be at least two marketplaces selected through this competition. The RFP was issued in October. It closed just past last Friday, November 15th. Um, there, my understanding is that there have been pre-award protests at um, both GAO and the agency level. Uh, so this will be delayed, okay. and you can be sure that, and lawyers are good at this, you know, making sure that it's delayed. <laughs> so that's at least in three months down the road before there'll be any resolution of the protests. I think that uh, Congress does this so often. They, they pass legislation that's confusing and contradictory. Uh, within that legislation, there are mixed messages to GSA. On one hand, it says, hey, Use commercial t terms and conditions. We don't want to complicate things here. Uh, but on the other hand, all these government rules should apply. So it is totally inconsistent. The legislation's inconsistent. And GSA, I think, has had a real challenge trying to reconcile the inconsistency. So it's going to be interesting how all this plays out. But there are many questions to be answered. Uh, one of the biggest is GSA it wants a fee, you know, just like when you pay a fee for the GSA schedules. Mm -hmm. They want a fee now for online marketplaces. Well, how's that going to be passed on? Uh, will, it, will suppliers, and GSA at least has indicated they wanted suppliers to raise their prices in order to cover the fee. And some online marketplaces don't want to do that, and they, wanted, they, they may just eat the fee. But who knows how this is going to play out. But my concern here is that the fee issue could be could be a, a real challenge on how that's implemented. And what about the products to be included? Is this, what, what will they buy off of this type of portal? Yeah, it, 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 everything, you know, it, and that's one thing GSA wanted. GSA wanted to limit this first to e-marketplaces, which by definition, it's really an Amazon or a Walmart. It's some, it's some platform that has lots and lots of third-party suppliers uh, selling everything. They specifically said, too, they did not want specialty 
marketplaces. So if you just did IT components, if you were just if you were a marketplace that just sold IT components, then you're out of this. You don't qualify. It has to be very broad. They want to try to hit all products. And quite frankly, they don't want um, the online marketplace to try to change the way they conduct themselves. You know, in other words, if you sell this in the commercial world on your marketplace, you should sell it to the government. They don't want necessarily the any type of change in that regard. Um, and so it will be interesting if, 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 as we move along here, if they'll let other marketplaces in that have maybe more targeted, like specialty items such as healthcare products, for example. That would be a specialty uh, online marketplace. But the bottom line here, Holly, I think this is the important point for the suppliers in the room. Uh, the government is not inventing online marketplaces. The government has been using online marketplaces for a long time. Uh, if you have a purchase card, if you have a purchase card, you can use an online marketplace. The important point is that the government is going to be spending more on online marketplaces. The micro-purchase threshold has gone from 3,500 to 10,000, which is huge. You may not think that's big in government terms, but that's a huge increase. So these online marketplaces are going to see more volume. GSA is predicting $6 billion through these online marketplaces that they're going to be hosting. So that's a lot. And so I think for suppliers, your objective should be to get on one or more of these platforms if you're not already, because there'll be government orders going through here much more in the future, irrespective of the GSA pilot. And the and GSA uses the word pilot, Holly, uh, and they will select or invite certain agencies to participate in the pilot. But in this regard, also GSA has made it very clear, anybody with the government purchase card at any agency can participate on this particular portal that GSA is going to host. Uh, but at, at some point in time, I'm sure GSA would like to migrate the entire federal government to this portal years from now. And uh, so that will, in effect, be a consolidated micro-purchase vehicle for the entire federal government. I'm sure that's what they would like to do in the future. But that's going to take a while. Meanwhile, every federal agency is purchasing uh, using Walmart, Amazon, all of them, uh, right now as we speak, and up to $10,000 for a purchase card uh, transaction. So you need to get on these platforms because the government's going to be spending more through online marketplaces in the future. It seems awfully inconsistent, and you mentioned congressional inconsistency already, but you know, to, to spend all of this or have industry spend all of this effort to get Huawei and Kaspersky out of the supply <laughs> chain, and then you've got a GS10 with a credit card who's never heard of the Huawei ban or is going to buy a device that's loaded with Kaspersky antivirus software that's not even in the product description. Um, it seems well, like here, you, here you go. So this is interesting. This is an interesting point, Matt. Um, so right now, if I go to in the online marketplace in a, with my federal credit card, you're right. Uh, there's basically no controls, there are no rules, and uh, you can pretty much buy whatever you can buy for under $10,000. This GSA portal will have certain new rules applying, and this is from the RFP, I read from the RFP. Uh, the platform provider must employ effective supply chain risk management processes and controls to ensure the integrity of the supply chain and its products offered on the platform. In other words, you, uh, Mr. Supplier, had better make sure you're not using any prohibited items such as Kaspersky. So the government is trying to control and these online marketplaces and, and put in place rules that don't currently apply. Mm -hmm. But here's another really interesting wrinkle. GSA has now clarified that suppliers are not subcontractors for purposes of this pilot. Um, that's an important point. So. But you see what they're doing here in the RFP. They're putting the burden on the platform provider. You, you're responsible for vetting and onboarding all your suppliers. You had better make sure that they comply. So there's not technically going to be a flow down of government contract clauses to the suppliers because you're not, they're not subcontractors. But the platform provider is going to be held accountable for making sure quality and conforming products are on that marketplace. It's going to be interesting. It's a, it's a real challenge, I think, for the platform providers because they haven't had to do this in the past. And to the extent they've only been dealing with commercial sales, this is going to be a new day because there, there will be government unique requirements imposed on the platform providers. 
So uh, what types of opportunities do you see here for contractors? I mean, you said get on them, obviously, but... Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a huge opportunity, and I, I, think, um, I think that there will be fewer rules, generally okay. speaking, than, um, and that's the good news. Uh, a lot of the, and the platform provider is going to have certain things attached to them, but not so much the suppliers. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that looking at $6 billion in the future going through online marketplaces with the federal government, if that estimate is correct, this is a good place to play. And I think uh, I would market to the agencies and try to make sure they're aware that you have certain products below the $10,000 threshold that uh, can be easily obtained through whichever platform you happen to be on. I think we're starting to see some companies that are developing those plans. Uh, nobody, well, I wouldn't say nobody, but uh, it's unfortunate that we had a pre-war protest to hold things up because this was rolling right along. And a number of companies, particularly product companies, some GSA schedule uh, contractors, were actively either pursuing or being pursued by some of the marketplace providers uh, as a way for them to reach the government market uh, in a different manner. Excellent. All right, we have a few minutes left to talk about schedule consolidation, so I wanted to throw that out just because it's finally here. Um, and should you, Larry, could you give us an overview on consolidation, what it is, and what this means for contractors. Certainly. Well, so GSA has already accomplished phase one of the three-phase consolidation by issuing a combined solicitation. So regardless of where you are in the schedules program, you're filling out the same solicitation. There is no longer, per se, a standalone IT70 schedule. It's all the schedules program uh, with a, a tab in there for what used to be IT70, so it's IT. and another tab for professional services and other tabs. Uh, if you look at it uh, as, a, as a physical catalog that has those tabs in it, I think that's a good uh, image to have. Uh, the second phase is coming out probably the end of January, and that's the one that current contractors should pay a lot of attention to, the mass modification phase, where GSA is going to be sending out modifications that will change the terms and conditions of your schedule contract so that they are more uniform. If you want to know what that means, look no further than the new solicitation that's already out because the terms and conditions that are in that solicitation are going to be the ones that GSA wants to mod into your existing contract. If you negotiated specialized terms and conditions, and many contractors did, please don't sign in return. There's absolutely no benefit for being the first person on your block to agree to this modification. Indeed, GSA is giving you twice the normal amount of time to comply until July, precisely because everybody should take the time to read through it. So that's phase two, and if we had more time, I would talk more about it, but that should be a big flashing yellow warning light to existing schedule contractors do a side-by-side -side analysis of what's in your contract now, what GSA would like to put into your contract, and if you can't live with that, it's time for another negotiation. Uh, the third phase, which is currently scheduled to come online uh, in uh, the end of July, uh, is if you're a company that has three or four different scheduled contracts today, uh, GSA is going to move to consolidate them all into one master schedule contract. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to that, like if you don't have, uh, if you have less than 12 months to run on a contract, they're not going to modify that one over, obviously. Uh, but uh, all the other ones are going to be uh, consolidated. You're going to end up with one contract, one lead contracting officer, and uh, overarching set of terms and conditions, but with some, some one-offs to reflect the reality of your particular different marketplaces. <clears throat> I'm asking GSA, and I'm hoping that they will push that phase off until after the fiscal year, uh, because they're also planning some other changes to their taxonomy uh, for the end of July. The combination process and the change of taxonomy, I think, could make it confusing to schedule buyers at the most popular time of year when the buyers are using the program. So we'll see what happens. All right, excellent. What benefits does this have for contractors? If any? Well, 
Well, I think the, the, the ultimate benefit for contractors is this gives you an opportunity to maybe get rid of some obsolete clauses that are most likely in your contracts uh, that uh, you're probably not really paying attention to anyway, even though you should. Uh, it also gives you a chance to clean up your contract in terms of uh, obsolete products or solutions that you may still have on contract that you've never deleted. Mm -hmm. GSA wants you to get rid of the obsolete offerings so that what's on your contract reflects what you're actually selling today. Uh, you know, the third option is to be, uh, benefit, I think, is to become more familiar with the terms and conditions of your contract. While that may seem kind of like a Debbie Downer phrase, I think everybody on this panel would agree that selling through a scheduled contract without understanding the terms and conditions of it uh, is not a long-term proposition for success. So that really is, uh, even though it may be like your annual checkup to the doctor, it's still something that's very necessary. I think, I think the biggest benefit to contractors is that there were 24 schedules with varying terms and conditions. The standard terms and conditions between the schedules vary dramatically. It drove contractors nuts. If you were on more than one schedule, and most contractors are on more than one schedule, the terms and conditions varied. They were inconsistent, uh, duplicative in some instances. This, this streamlining effort that GSA is doing is really is a good th thing. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a lot of growing pains here with respect to the transition. But I think three to five years from now, people would be very glad that these 24 schedules were reduced down to one with standard terms and conditions um, for the first time. Uh, yes, there can be specially negotiated ones, but I think the government really wants to try to make this simpler and have pretty much a standard set of terms and conditions. Uh, so I think that's a huge benefit. And GSA deserves a lot of credit here, too, because of the dialogue they had with industry. Over 1,000 comments on this initiative were reviewed by GSA, and that's, they deserve credit for reaching out to industry on this. All right, we have a few minutes for some questions, if anyone has any. Yes. Oh, wait, this is uh, being recorded, so wait for the microphone to come to you. There you go. Good morning. There is a contract, a, a government-wide acquisition contract that's out there, best in class. They have a portal out there that facilitates the SCRM. Um, I'm just curious, Rob, to you perhaps, is there any collaboration going on from GSA with this other contract vehicle, SOUP? I, I, I really can't speak to that. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jana, thank you. Thanks. I've got two questions, one dumb one uh, and then one hopefully smart one. But the dumb one is, uh, you guys opened my eyes. I, I was not aware of this new supply chain rule coming out. So just for my sake, could you tell me what that rule or law is so that I can do some research on it on my own? And then, we refer to as Section 889. Section 889. So if you look uh, up under Section 889 on a standard search, you Perfect. will find this. That. And the, there, it's important to find both the triggers. Great. Thank you. And the second follow-up question is ideal in open source software. And unless you're really familiar with the open source software world, you don't realize, and so many contracting folks don't. So that gets back to the comment you made earlier about rule versus daily behavior. Um, but uh, in open source software, there's community software that is the Wild West. I mean, there is no secure supply chain in that stuff. And there's enterprise open source software, which my company deals in, and there are a lot of companies that sell enterprise open source software where people go out and they get the open source software and they sign it and say, this has a secure supply chain. I promise I stand behind it. Uh, are these sorts of topics being discussed and considered in this secure supply chain uh, section 889 um, That's a great question. world? Or, or I suspect well, so not. But section 889 is, uh, talks about covered uh, telecommunications and IT. So that would, I guess, transcend both hardware and software. But the thrust of it, at least to my knowledge, was for hardware, how much they're looking at open source software. That is probably not the issue that was foremost or even secondary in their mind. I see. So it's mostly a hardware thing. But of course, at some point, the line between hardware and software gets a little fuzzy, too. Right. So OK, great. Thank you very much. Do we have time for one more, Jana? Did anyone else have a? Uh, okay, yes. 
I'm just curious um, with the consolidation of the GSA schedules, if um, the contract administration aspect, like the contract specialists you deal with and the contracting officers, are they going to be consolidated so that it's a more consistent experience, um, i.e. West Coast, East Coast? I've had a lot of different experiences and it would be a lot nicer if it was consistent. Do you know if there's any plan to have a head contracts guru over there that just... That's a, a really good question on a, a number of fronts. Uh, certainly GSA is taking steps to ensure that its workforce is trained. Uh, given my experience with other GSA initiatives, it's likely that industry will know a little bit more about GSA's acquisition than GSA's acquisition workforce will know about these changes. So contractors are going to be put in the position of having to maybe educate and work with their contracting specialists and contracting officers. Even though they will have received training, it may not have been as frequent as the message that industry has gotten. Certainly, I think GSA's long-term goal with this is to make a more flexible acquisition workforce so that they can better manage the workload among contracts in the schedules program. So uh, they, and I think in the long term, you may not see acquisition centers set up around specific areas. Well, if you don't have an IT schedule, why do you have an IT acquisition center? Uh, that's, that's going to come. Will there ever be the point of magic consistency? Probably not, but I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing because you can have something that's consistently rotten, too. Uh, the big thing that GSA is going to have to tread carefully on in this area that we don't think about in industry, but they do, is that uh, these are people's jobs and they don't want to be seen as jeopardizing people's careers or jobs and they don't want to be seen as requiring somebody who's working out of uh, Washington, D.C. today to have to transfer to Atlanta tomorrow in order to keep their job. So I think that that part of it, while it's coming, is going to be uh, coming out in due time. <laughs> so. All right, thank you. Um, we're out of time, but thanks everyone for joining our session. Thank you to our panelists. You all were great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.